Are you alive this morning? Glory. Would you lift up your hands and let's glorify Jesus? He's the head of the church, he's the savior of the body. All things are made by him and for him. Thrones are dominion, principalities and powers, visible and invisible. It's before all things. In him all things consist. It has pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell in him. And of his fullness we have received grace for grace. For the Lord came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. You want to celebrate him this morning and say, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And as we teach this morning, everyone is blessed, everyone is lifted, everyone is edified, everyone is strengthened, and everyone is encouraged to the teaching of the word and by the power of the Spirit. Thank you for the release of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, spreading to the many and causing thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God, to the praise and glory of your name. Thank you for this house. Glorify this house that this house will glorify you. Thank you for your word. Glorify your word that your word will glorify you. Thank you for your son. Glorify your son that your son will glorify you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a big hand as you take your seat. Thank you very much. The best choir in the world. <laughs> Amen. Every pastor says that about their choir. So because I'm here, they are the best. When I get back to church, they are the best. So best will be jamming best. Amen. Sincerely, it's indeed a great privilege to be here this morning. But like I said, to save time, I will save all that to the third service. So I will say some things about my brother and his beloved wife. So um, let's get into the word. Uh, Luke 18, 8. <laughs> I have a problem when the... We have multiple services. I don't know how to repeat myself. <laughs> so wherever I stop in the first service, I continue in the second service. So I can only encourage you to get the teaching because there's so much to unpack and we don't have time uh, to start looking at those things one by one. Praise God. Bring you greetings from United Kingdom, from our wife and family. And um, we trust God. God will do awesome things there. Luke 18, 8. And we look at Matthew 8. <laughs> so in this second installment, <laughs> what I want to look at is what Christ described as the greatest fate. <laughs> Dr. Zopi, we, we must interrogate that. How can this fate of the centurion be described by Jesus as the greatest fate? And that is in answer to what he said in Luke 18, 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. And now this is Jesus talking. He said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? So, so that means among other expectations, so winning, the beautiful things we do for God, this is Jesus voicing out one of his expectations. And he said, I'm looking for something on the earth. What is that thing he's looking for? Faith. And he was, he was concerned until one day he met somebody who answered this concern. He said, I, the son of man, I'm looking for something. When people gather like this, just like we saw in the first service, when he's interceding for us, what is he really telling the father? Because that is the ministry he has assumed now. He lives forever to make intercession for us. So we need to know what he's saying to the father every time he's interceding for us. And we looked at that and dealt with that in the first service. So in this second service, he's voicing out his expectation. He says, we are seated here. I'm looking for something. And look at how he put it. Shall he find faith? Because one of the rare commodities on the earth is faith. And as he was ministering, he was telling them that I'm looking for something. And look at Matthew 8. You see why the story of the centurion is very important. Now, Matthew 8 now. Let's begin from verse number 5. Now, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord... My servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Uh, please, the multimedia team, if you can help me to change it to New King James Version. I don't use King James Version. I use the New King James Version. I will appreciate that. Because I live in England, nobody is saying, where upon, where unto, thou, dine. Imagine I go to a store and I say, lo, I want a where upon, where unto, where for. 
a cup of coffee. <laughs> so what King James, New King James Version does is that it takes away the archaic English and it uses the present English we speak in England now. Praise God. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. And the basis of that conversation is nigh. For I'm a man under authority. Having soldiers under me, I say to this one, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he doesn't check with me, he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he doesn't question it, he does it. When Jesus had it. <laughs> what was it that Jesus had? That the Bible described as it. <laughs> when Jesus had it, he marveled. So this is the first guy on heart to dace Jesus. He marveled and said to those who followed, make no mistake, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found, because that's what I've been looking for, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, And I say to you, now in verse 11, what Jesus did there is to open to us the back end of this kind of faith. That means in the realm of the spirit, how did this guy got, I mean, how did he get this kind of intelligence? In verse 11, Jesus began to open it up and he said, I said to you, the reason why this guy said what he said and this eat that I'm describing is because he sat with Abraham. He said, many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Move on. But the sons of the kingdom who ought to sit there will be cast out into outer darkness. And wherever that is happening, the result is that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed. So let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Hmm. Why is this the greatest fate according to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because like I said, Jesus is a perfect example. So if he said this is the greatest faith, then we must interrogate this faith. For the first time in the life and ministry of Jesus, somebody approached him and said to Jesus, my servant is here, sick. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And the guy said, don't come. <laughs> One of the reasons why this faith is the greatest faith is the concept of audacity of faith. How can God say he wants to visit you and you say no? You don't get what this guy did to Jesus. Jesus called Peter. He said, set our itinerary for today by 12 noon. We're going to visit this guy. And this guy said, don't waste your time. You don't need to come to my house. Don't come. In fact, I don't need you to come. Because you see that in the next instance in the next schedule Jesus went to Peter's house to heal the mother-in-law. So people love it when Jesus come to their home. When he saw Zacchaeus, he said, come down today I will abide in your house. Salvation has come into your house. People were longing to have Jesus come into their house. But this guy said, sir, I will be the first man on earth to change your itinerary. Don't come to my house. You don't need to come. Because this guy said, and the basis of that conversation is that I understand the military. Oh, you are not getting this. That means one of the ways to enhance your capacity on the faith lane is to look at your profession. <laughs> this greatest faith did not quote Hebrews 11. The guy said, I might not understand all these things that you guys say, but there is something I understand. And that thing is called the military. And the moment the guy taught, touched on that, Jesus marveled. First lesson, whenever you are on the faith lane, you are no longer a civilian. <laughs> the guy just fully operationalized how faith works. And he said the greatest profession on art that depicts the working of faith is the military. 
The guy said, the, I'm going to approach it is this. I'm a man under authority. So he looked at Jesus. He said, the question here is not your physical presence. The question here is that who has got the greatest authority? Now my servant is sick. Is the sickness of a higher authority or you? And because I understand the workings of the military, in the military, a higher authority tells you low authority to go. And it goes. A higher authority tells the low authority to come. What happens? It comes. A higher authority tells the low authority to do this and it does it. And he said, as I'm looking at you, Jesus, I figured over time that you are the greatest authority here. And when authority is released, physical presence is not needed because authority is voice activated. <laughs> and Jesus said, tell me something. <laughs> For the first time, Jesus was like, what? Where did that come from? That is coming from a military man who understood the working of the military and underpinned the working of faith with the working of the military. And Jesus said, you got it. So look at you this morning. It is good to have the presence of God. Because what Jesus offered this guy on a platter of good was his presence. And the guy said, no. The guy said, your presence is not as important as your word. He said, instead of coming to my house, from where you are now, speak. <laughs> that means the guy is saying, your is, even if you come physically, what you are still going to do is to speak. And I figured over time that there's no distance in the realm of the spirit. So instead of coming, coming, why not just speak now? Because what is going to still get the job done even after you come is speaking. So let's save, let's cut short, let's cut the chase. Speak the word. And Jesus said, who said that? <laughs> why, is this is all, why is this also very important? Let me digress a little and we'll come back to this. We're, in the, we're at the verge of a major revival that is about to hit Nigeria. I've been in this country since 1st of, August, 1st of July, and I'm leaving tomorrow, 1st of August. So I'm just here for one month. And everywhere I've ministered, I've ministered in about 20 meetings so far now. I've always said one thing. We are in the midst, at the verge of a major revival. The biggest thing in the agenda of God for Nigeria is not 2023 elections. A revival is about to break out that will even shape the elections. Guess what? In the midst of these revivals, God is going to raise professionals on the faith lane. And a very good depiction of that is the story of this centurion. That you do not need to be a pastor. You do not need to be a minister to understand faith. Because the one that wrote two very important books in the Bible was a medical doctor. Gospel according to St. Luke, Acts of Apostles, 24 chapters of Gospel according to St. Luke, 28 chapters of Acts of Apostles written by a medical doctor who met a guy by the name of Theophilus. That is the shape of the upcoming revival. So what the centurion is doing here is to let us understand that it does not matter where you are in the scheme of things, you are very, very important. Because you will have taught a disciple will be communicating to Jesus at this level. This was a centurion who was not even a disciple. And Jesus said, this guy is manifesting the greatest faith. So that means on the faith lane, if you fail professionally, you don't understand faith. Your profession is one of the highest manifestations of faith. Or how else would the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is our perfect example, who ought to be in the temple chanting psalms, why did he spend 18 years of his life as a carpenter if profession is not important? Because you would have thought, after all, by 12, Jesus already met the teachers of the law. He should stay back in Jerusalem and start chanting psalms. Then it's easy to be Christ. 
But God made him to understand that until you carpenterize, you can't be the Christ. That means profession, professional training is part of the faith flow. So when people are slothful in business, they can't be fathered in the spirit and they can't serve the Lord. You will have thought the Son of God will be raised in an atmosphere where people are chanting psalms. The Son of God was raised in an atmosphere where they were doing eight to five. Carpentry is an, a profession of precision. Five meter is five meter. Allergy is coming to collect the table tomorrow. The table must be ready. So it's a profession filled with deadlines. So when Christ started preaching for three and a half years, nobody accused him that you, you are now preaching. Now. What, what about the dining table we gave you? He didn't complete it. But what he got was that, is this not the carpenter? That means Christ was the best carpenter. That people were offended that the carpenter is now a preacher. <laughs> How do you explain that? That the training of Christ, that means everything Christ taught as a preacher, he knew as a carpenter. Because the only gap between carpentry and ministry for Christ was 40 days in the wilderness. And you can't learn everything in 40 days. So as he was making the table, he was meditating on Isaiah. As he was making the stool, he was meditating on Deuteronomy. By the time he got to the wilderness of temptation, the three answers he gave to Satan, it is written, is from the book of Deuteronomy. That means ever before he went into ministry as a carpenter, he knew the Deuteronomy word for word. To such an extent, by the time Satan came, he knew the portion of Deuteronomy to quote when he said it is written. So therefore, the centurion and Christ, they are both telling us that the reason why you are backsliding is not because you are doing 8 to 5. Christ grew in an atmosphere of 8 to 5. How can a military man be teaching us faith? Military man. This is not a preacher. The disciples did not get this. And that's why for the disciples, he will rebuke them. Say, oh, ye of little faith. Disciples. <laughs> but a centurion. Jesus said, who said that? And to show that this professional aspect and manifestation of our faith is very, very important in this game of things. When Christ was choosing his disciples, deliberately he did not call a single priest deliberately he didn't call a single levite jesus called busy people oh you are not getting this because only busy people can run the gospel yes, sir. oh show me one place in the bible where god called anyone who is not busy but today people are using the fact that they are busy as an excuse to excuse themselves from spiritual things but you do not know that when he wanted to call the disciples, he didn't even call them in their break time. It was as they were casting a net into the sea. That means, that means Jesus is looking for people who have operationalized their profession. And whenever he sees operation, he says that is faith. Is it not amazing like John the Baptist when Jesus wanted to teach the kingdom? He never said the kingdom is like God in heaven, angels bowing. He used social economic terms to explain the gospel. He said, when you see a guy going to the farm and sowing seed, and as he's sowing some are falling by the wayside, that is a kingdom. When a guy receives two talents and he multiplies it and makes it four, that's a kingdom. That means he's saying whenever people are busy, that is when the kingdom can express itself. So God is not looking for lazy people. So stop preaching the fact that I'm busy. Use the fact that you are busy to get into the faith flow. When he was going to call James and Zebede, they were with Zebede, their father, and the hired servant. How about Matthew? The guy was working in FIRS, Federal Inland Revenue Service. He was just writing the last tax receipt. And Jesus said, this is the kind of person we need. Eight to five guys are the ones that can be the greatest disciples. We are not looking for people who are free. We are looking for people who are busy. Because in your being busy, what you do not understand is that you're already a man of faith. <laughs> so as the centurion was practicing the military, faith was born. And he only needed to look at Jesus and say, look, I might not understand all the scripture. But one thing I understand in the military, I'm a man under authority. I'm a man under authority. Look at me, everyone. Say, I'm a man under authority. 
I'm a man under authority because I'm under the authority of the word. I'm under the authority of the word. Once you know you are a man under authority, what happens to you on the faith floor is that you have soldiers under you. What you are calling situations in life that trouble you are actually soldiers under you. The problem is that you are not using them. <laughs> and to explain this, because I'm conscious of time now, very well. Jesus said, what the centurion said is wonderful, right? But let me now let you into what really happened here. He now went to that verse. He said, many will come from the east and from the west and will sit with Abraham. For crying out loud, if not that Jesus is, our, is the greatest teacher, how do you link that story to Abraham? How is Abraham cited and referenced in this one? In, in Centurion saying what he said, Jesus said the greater lesson here is that this guy just manifested the intelligence of Abraham. This, is that, this whole story is Abrahamization of things. <laughs> what is Abraham doing here? You will ask me, why Abraham? So that means Jesus is saying authoritatively, when he's, listen to what the guy said, he said, this guy sat with Abraham. Look at me. On the faith lane, one of the resources that is given to us to sit with is the story of Abraham. Once you're able to sit with that story, it will be easy to manifest what the centurion is manifesting here. So that means Jesus is saying, those who are supposed to sit there, unfortunately, are not sitting there because the sons of the kingdom. Actually, that seat is made for kingdom people. But unfortunately, some on kingdom people are assessing these seats. It's so sad that what we ought to be doing on the faith lane, we see those who are not supposed to be. And Jesus said, whenever that is the case, there will be weeping. So whenever people are weeping and gnashing their teeth, it's because they lost their seat. Somebody says, sit with Abraham. Why Abraham? That we immediately, because if this guy is saying the military is the basis of understanding faith, and Christ is citing and referencing Abraham in this story, and Isaac, in the second, third service, I'll deal with the Isaac side of things. But in this second service, let's look at Abraham. That means Abraham must have manifested military, military intelligence. That takes you back to Genesis 14. That means Abraham must have had soldiers under him. That means Abraham must have fought. That means all that Jesus is saying is that the world faith enterprise is a fight. Fight the good fight of faith. And the way you fight that fight is how Abraham fought it. Are you ready for this now? So that means the world back end of this story is Abraham. So in Genesis 14, because of time, trust me, he's there. <laughs> Suddenly, all these kings were fighting. Wars were breaking out, left, right, and center. And it does appear God came to Abraham. Now, listen to this, because now it gets prophetic now. In the days we live in, trust the Lord to tell you what next to do professionally. The days we live in will demand a lot of people changing career paths. It does not matter what you study in the university. If you want to manifest this kind of faith, at some point God comes to you and he can tell you the next thing now is fashion. Don't let such instructions be strange to you. Because Abraham all his life was a farmer and a trader in silver and gold. And one day an intelligence came to him in Genesis 14. He said, Abraham, go and train and prepare for military service. How do you process that? To such an extent that Abraham acquired military training and he was now able to train 318 others. I'm a man under authority having soldiers under me. So in life and in this new revival, how you are going to fight is how many soldiers you can raise under you. So that means our professions now must be weaponized. Am I talking to somebody this morning? You can't just be a doctor for the sake of being a doctor. 
So that means we must understand the demands of the time. What exactly? Because a lot of, you see, that's why Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me tell you a story. Whether you like it or not in this life or in the afterlife, you will still have conversations with Abraham. You know the problem with the, with the rich man? He had conversations with Abraham too late. Because the rich man died. Lazarus died. Only for the rich man after he died to now find out that even in the afterlife project, Abraham is still the chairman. <laughs> you are not getting what I'm saying? So he opened his eye and he saw Father Abraham. How I wish, like the centurion, while he was on earth, he had that conversation with Abraham. Because by the time he now saw Abraham, he said, Father Abraham, he said, you know what? I, I didn't even know that you are still the chairman here. Okay, I have five brothers. Because what that story is telling us is that once people die, the value system is reset immediately. You see, you will know what is important. I, I mean, you, this was a guy, while he was here on earth, he didn't care about his brothers. But suddenly when he died, he just realized that, ah, so that means once people die, another life begins immediately. So death is not really what we think death is because that is Jesus taking us into the intelligence of death to show us that why people are mourning here and they are saying you are dead or they, they are embalming the person and putting him in, 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 in a mortuary. The person is already living another life on the other side. And in the other side, in most cases, is a life filled with regret for those who don't listen to Abraham yet. So he said, Father Abraham, how far? He said, can you send Lazarus to go and warn them so that they don't come into this place? And you know what Abraham said? Abraham said, ah, it doesn't work like that. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. The guy said, no, 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 no. Let somebody be born from hell. Here, yeah. if the person should show up to them, they will repent. Abraham said, look, if they don't listen to Pastor Shola, Dr. Ebele, Pastor, Ebele, Pastor Abigail, they won't still repent. Even if somebody comes in here smelling like hell. <laughs> so Abraham says the way God works is the integrity of his word. He doesn't have anything to offer other than his word. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophet, don't think a testimony from hell will persuade them. That is not how God operates. Somebody there? So, what is the difference between the centurion and the rich man? The centurion quickly had a conversation with Abraham in life. The rich man had a conversation with Abraham when it was too late. So whether you like it or not on both sides, you can't escape Abraham. So the earlier you sit with Abraham, the better. And that is why the Bible says those who walk in the steps of the faith. So Abraham took some steps, and that is why the believer by default, the moment you get on the faith lane, the first reconfiguration for you is that God reconfigures you as a seed of Abraham. What is a seed? A seed is a sequence of growth that reproduces after its own kind. Your kind is Abraham. So in scripture, there are two places to look. You are looking unto Jesus, but at the same time, you look at Abraham. So for Abraham, look. For Jesus, looking. <laughs> he said, look at Abraham, your father, isn't it? But he said, looking unto Jesus. Because even the Jesus you are looking unto operated here as a seed of Abraham. So there is only one way to survive this art. It is to get that mantle that is called Abraham. It's called the Abrahamization of things. Because the meaning of that story is that because Abraham is the father of faith, Everything Abraham experienced is what you are experiencing today. So you are the Abraham version 2022. <laughs> so you are the Abraham of today. And, and, and that is why you need to study Abraham. Since you are the Abraham of today, and you know what happened to the Abraham of then, it's still what is happening to you. So it is easy to quickly sit down and say, in the Abrahamization of things, where am I? Because is it that you are believing God for Isaac? Is it that you are fighting? Is it that... There's a young girl there by the name Ega that is tempting you. Is it that you want to bat Ishmael? Is it that you are struggling with God? Is it that you are going to Egypt? You want to run to Canada when the Lord has not sent you there? And we will say, Pastor, don't say that, but you live in England. I went because the Lord said go. So I'm a man under authority. I didn't go because Nigeria was tough. I went because the Lord said, I have a work for you there. Go there. Praise God forevermore. So ask yourself. Let, let's do a bit of test now. Let's make this practical. Where are, are you in your Abraham story? Because that's your story. 
And that's why God said, look at Abraham, your father. Say, you are looking for righteousness. You want God to turn things around. He said, I've given you a template. Look at your father. So somebody fathered this message. Somebody fathered this message we are trying to understand this morning. And it became a template and a mantra in the realm of the spirit. And one thing about mantras is that, you see, once you find templates in, in spiritual things, which was the problem with John the Baptist. You see, John the Baptist did not know he was Elijah. If he knew, Herodia would not have killed him. Because the same thing that happened to Elijah happened to John the Baptist. Number one, confront rulers. John the Baptist did. And the moment you carry that mantra and you confront ruler, the wife of the king will come for you. The moment Elijah confronted Ahab, Jezebel said, may God do so to me. If by tomorrow your head is on your neck. John the Baptist confronted Herod. Herod came for him. But because he did not know it was Elijah, what did the real Elijah do? He ran. That was a good time for John the Baptist to have run. So that means he was not supposed to be beheaded. He was just supposed to survive it by no. And, and that was why he paid Jesus. You know, when Jesus was going to reveal that, he said, He that art and near, if you are able to receive it, because you know everybody that can receive it, said that was Elijah who was to come. Because they asked John, say, Are you Elijah? He said, No. Meanwhile, he got it almost 50%. He was dressing like Elijah. He was eating like Elijah. But when he was supposed to run like Elijah. So look at Abraham, your father. So if your wife is seated beside you and husband asks, he said, look, where are we in our Abraham story? <laughs> Abraham chapter number what? Because you are the version 2022 of Abraham. So God sent you here, Abraham, Mist already. You are a seed of Abraham. So you can't behave otherwise. When, when the Jews were trying to, to say stuff to Jesus, that, he said, and Jesus, John the Baptist had to warn them, said, don't, don't say that you have Abraham as your father. And Jesus now looked at them. He said, if you are the seed of Abraham, then do the works of Abraham. So it's not just confession that I'm a seed of Abraham. I'm a seed of Abraham. That means at some point God will open the portal and say, now demonstrate that you are the seed of Abraham. So we are saying now that in this greater story, Abrahamization of things is important when God is placing demand on you to change career. How can a farmer and a gold dealer suddenly become a military warlord? You can imagine Abraham went to military school. Abraham was using RPG. Abraham, and you begin to wonder, Father of faith, what are you doing here? Ah, God says, this new wave will demand you being equipped professionally. You see, we need to understand the demands of the time. That was what, because all around Abraham were wars. And God was like, Abraham, to survive this next phase, if these wars will not take you out, acquire the training. And Abraham said, yes, sir. It, it started. We don't know how long it took. Then God said, everybody around you start training them. You know how many people Abraham trained? 318. Look at your neighbor. Say, the meaning of the game now is training. Training and retraining. Look, God is going to place demands on you and all you need to do is to start training. Because Nigeria is not really going, going the way many of us think it will go. So in the Abrahamization of things, God will place demands on you to retrain. So make no mistake, after you have gotten your first degree, after you have worked for 15 years, when God tells you again to go back to school. It didn't make sense. So they wake up every morning, like NYSC. They are jogging. Abraham was trained there. And, and I'm sure the 318 of them were looking at Abraham. They're like, what's the meaning of this now? Why are we Which battle exactly are we preparing for? Why is it not normal life? Is it not normal life? You see, in, on the faith lane, there's no normal life. There's a reason why you are in that office. There's a reason why you're in that outpost. And one day, I hope you hear the clarion call that Lot has been captured. That is the sign to move. How did Abraham know it was time to join the battle? The Bible says somebody came and said, They've captured Lot. And all across Nigeria, what is happening is that lots are being captured every day. Guess what? How did the Bible describe Lot? It said that is the righteous man. But the reason of what is happening, vexing his righteous soul daily. 
We see a lot being captured on social media, in news media, in print, in newspapers. But instead of us responding like Adam, like Abraham, many of us are also playing the Lord card. You are not the victim of the circumstances. You are the deliverer. On the faith lane, you are not the victim of what is happening in Nigeria, this bad governance. You are not the victim. Stop playing the victim card. Because on the faith lane, you are more than a conqueror. You are fighting the good fight of faith, and all you are doing is to lay hold. Because once you play the victim, you are already captured. And guess what? Abraham joined the battle. Abraham. Can, can you play the picture in your mind? Look at Abraham. What what? 300. Imagine, what's the name of the leader of 300? The guy. Wasn't it? Now, lad, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Pastor Bailey, help me. I know you watch movies. <laughs> no, not those. Imagine I was Abraham. And Abraham said, ah, who? Ah, who? <laughs> Father of faith. And you are like, what are you doing there? Father Abraham, I told you you'd be praying. You are the father of faith. Abraham said, this is the good fight of faith. We fight professionally. Look at the training. Abraham did not imagine Abraham going to that battle and say, I am I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. No weapon, no training. And he said, I will win this battle in Jesus' name because I'm the man of faith. Oh yeah, all your weapons stop. The man of faith is there. Abraham fought. Abraham trained. Abraham trained. Abraham fought. The only way we are going to beat the system is that we will beat them spiritually. We also beat them naturally. Look at all that discipline in church. Look at the level of excellence there. Where do you get this other than church? So that means church already prepared you for this battle. Just like campus fellowship. People went to campus fellowship, joined protocol unit, and they started protocol business after school. Because campus fellowship rated the spirit of people so high that they did not know this is warfare by other means. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God. If I'm going to change this country, this is a template. So Abraham, I, I like the way Hebrews 7 put it. He said, when Abraham was returning from the slaughter, <laughs> you don't understand. You don't want to see Abraham slaughtering. Abraham, he said, King, bring your neck here. Jam, jam, Abraham. He said, in the name of Jesus, we we'll slaughter you. <laughs> Abraham was returning from the slaughter of kings. Abraham. Returning from the slaughter of kings. So, so, so when the Bible talks about that, the wealth of the Gentiles being transferred, a lot of people are waiting that I'll just sit in my house and the wealth will just be transferred like an alert into my phone. <laughs> the only way the wealth of the Gentiles will be transferred is to fight the Gentiles. And we are not fighting them because we hate them. We are just saying there's another king whose name is Jesus. So every time you go to work, let's say you're a doctor and you treat a patient shabbily, you are not Abrahamizing. That means you are not fighting the good fight of faith. That means you do not understand what the centurion is saying. If you are going late to work and you only go to work when your boss is there, when your boss is not there, you are doing your thing, you don't understand this kind of warfare. So Abraham fought, defeated five kings. How, how, oh God, how much training did Abraham acquire that Abraham could defeat five kings. Abraham recovered everything. And why is this important? Please, can you strike a key for me on the keyboard? Why is this important as we close? We continue in the third service. How many of you were in the first service? And you're also part of this. Ah, you are blessed. And I hope some other people also will be part of the third service who are also part of this service. So that we can conclude. To show how serious this interaction with was, as Abraham was returning, one functionary showed up. His name is Melchizedek. Why on earth did Melchizedek wait for this time? That means even Melchizedek was waiting. You see, I don't want to go into some things. I think I dealt with some of those things in Wabek. You can go and listen to my teaching, my second session. Because a lot of people feel God wasn't operating on the earth before Adam. 
there were operations of God on the earth before Adam. Adam was not the beginning of God. <laughs> and one of those manifestations was Melchizedek. Because how can a man come, and the Bible says in Hebrews 7, it tells us, consider this man. And he said, without father, without mother. So what he's trying to tell us that he belongs to another age that is not captured by the Abrahamic flow. Because don't forget the one that wrote Genesis 1 was Moses. And Moses was not born until Exodus. So all that Moses wrote about Genesis was what God revealed. And it was to the extent to which God chose to reveal. Because the hidden things belong to our God. And the things that are revealed. So there are hidden things in God. It's not everything God has revealed. And once in a while, he reveals some of those hidden things based on the act of mercy. So if Moses was only shown up until the Ark of Noah, you know what Moses would have written? In the beginning, mankind came out of the Ark. And it would be accurate because that was the extent to which he saw. Or else, when there was war in heaven and Lucifer fell, why will God said, woe to you, the inhabitants of the earth, if the people were not on the earth? And that was before Adam. So they were inhabitants of the heart before Adam. <laughs> he said, for Satan has come to you having great wrath because his time is short. We know that one predated Adam. So they were inhabitants. And you see, in that era, you, you could just read Psalms. He said, in Judah, God is known. His tabernacle was in Salem. So Melchizedek was the king of Salem. So that means that was the original operating headquarters of God before Adam. And somebody had the authority at that level and he was waiting for the first man that would manifest faith accurately so that they can hand over to that man. And Melchizedek showed up. He was, Abraham was the only human being that met Melchizedek. He was the first and the last. No other person met Melchizedek before Abraham. And after Abraham, no other person met Melchizedek. The only person that wrote about Melchizedek, uh, two people actually, David in Psalm 110 and Paul in Hebrews 7. Because they now understood that the essence of the ministry of Christ was that Christ came as an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that completes the faith cycle because it's a seed of Abraham. We'll continue in the third service. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hello, thank you for watching us. We don't want this to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You know, um, after listening to God's word like this and you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's an opportunity to come to him and it's a simple process because he has made all things available. I want to implore you now to give your heart to Christ. And by saying these words, because giving your heart to Christ must be done consciously, he has paid the price. Say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you shed your blood for my justification. I accept your finished work right now and I confess that you are the Lord of my life. I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus. If you have said those words, you are actually born again, a new creation in Christ. Join us for more of this. God bless you.